Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 548 of the podcast. And yes, last week (laughs) I also said the same number. I got a bit out of sync, but this really is 548. And it is Thursday 29th of April 2021 as I record this, a little bit earlier than usual. Just a reminder as we come to the end of April that one third of the year 2021 has now passed us by. And I think it's a good time to reflect and say, okay, well, am I a third of the way through my goals for the year? And I know it's a difficult time, but last year was also a difficult time. And let's face it, it's going to continue. So let's just stop and take a minute and go, okay, am I a third of the way through? To be honest, I feel like I'm a bit behind, but I'm trying to take it easy too. So you can you can take it easy on yourself for sure. I give you permission if you need it. But also let's just have a think about that because can you believe it's May already? By the time this goes out, it will be May. So anyway, in today's show, I'm talking to Nadine Mutas about self-publishing in translation, how to decide what languages are worth doing, whether it's worth it for your genre, how to find a translator and tips for marketing. Translation is definitely a more advanced topic and only for those authors who are selling enough to have a budget for this. I'm definitely not saying you should be doing this if you're just starting out. But it's definitely something to think about, especially as the costs are coming down. And I talked about my own process using DeepL for AI translation for the first draft in episode 461. If you want to go and listen to that, and AI translation has dramatically improved in the I guess around 18 months since I did the first three books and then I did another book earlier this year. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, quite a bit going on this week. First up, if you have ever wanted to see a template publishing contract, or if you've had one before, you can have some of the terms explained. The Authors Guild have put one up on their site with commentary about the clauses, and it's really super useful. And I checked the grant of rights section and they do specify territory, formats, term and languages. Really, really good resource at the Authors Guild. Uh, I've made a smart link because it's quite difficult to get to. So it's thecreativepen.com forward slash guild contract. And that will take you straight there or check the show notes. And talking of contracts, there is now a hash Disney must pay task force. Now, there was uh, one writer who basically said Disney had not paid him royalties. Now it turns out there's a lot more. There's a coalition of author groups calling for Disney to pay outstanding royalties owed to writers of novels and comics, including Star Wars, Alien and Buffy the Vampire Slayer series. And this is reported in The Guardian. This is very important. Um, So basically, the claim is that they purchased the rights, but not the obligations of the contract. So the intellectual property rights, but not the obligations to pay royalties based on that IP. Now, of course, this is important because it's a very big organisation and many contracts change hands over time. This isn't just about a company like Disney. This is about all the companies that might take hold of a contract at some point. Smaller companies inevitably get bought by bigger companies and this kind of thing sets a bad precedent. This sort of, we own the IP but not the obligations of the contract to pay you for it. Now this task force includes major writers like Neil Gaiman, Tess Gerritsen, Mary Robinette Cowell and Chuck Wendig. It's been formed by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America in partnership with the Authors Guild, the Horror Writers Association, National Writers Union, Novelists Inc., Romance Writers of America and Sisters in Crime. So this is a big group of people and you can check out the new task force site and especially if you're one of these people who's written tie-in books, definitely go check this out, writersmustbepaid.org. Again, links in the show notes. Also, Thad McElroy at The Future of Publishing has an article this week saying publishing's problem is not a tech problem. 
Amongst other things, he talks about the longer term impact of technological disruption on the movie industry. So we've been talking a lot about the music industry, but it's also because we've had the Oscars, uh, an interesting reflection on movies. So movies used to be an event. This is uh, sort of paraphrasing his blog post. Movies used to be an event, so you would go specifically at a certain time, everyone would be watching the same thing, all the media would be reporting on the same releases, and it was very much a sort of spike event. Now, with Netflix and other streaming models, it is a pool of content available any time. And so if you go to your TV and you switch it on, and there's always something to watch, and most people are fragmented into subgroups where we're all watching different things. And There are rarely these big things that everyone is watching at the same time. And this is also reflected in the book world. The model used to be about hits and event books uh, where everyone would be talking and reading about the same thing and the publishers would flood the bookstores with exactly the same books on all the front tables so you just couldn't escape it and they'd flood the media. And that's the traditional book launch that used to be relied on. But what's happened uh, increasingly, and obviously the pandemic has really changed this, and he quotes a Publishers Weekly article where a lot of traditional publishers discuss this, the increasing issue of selling new or frontless books. And sourcebooks Dominique Ricard says she attributes lower frontless sales to discoverability issues with respect to online, with the move to online sales essentially seeing the big gains in backlist sales, not frontless sales. So basically, the pool model of having lots of books where people dip in at different times really suits the model of the backlist because people are discovering things. You know, a book is new to the person who's just discovered it. So rather than the main source of revenue coming from the hits, the main source of revenue last year in 2020 came from backlist. Jane Friedman also comments on this in The Hot Sheet, uh, the wonderful newsletter I highly recommend you subscribe to. She cites a New York Times report that 98% of new titles in 2020 sold less than 5,000 copies, <laughs> which is, and that's traditionally published. She says that was a shock to some, but to long time industry vets, not so much. Backlist sales, according to NPD Bookscan, are now 67% of all book sales. And uh, this shift towards backlist sales accelerated as bookstores closed to foot traffic. To gain momentum for a title, publishers rely on advertising spend through the various online retail platforms, which is why we've all seen a lot more competition in places where we've been that we've been using for years, like BookBub deals, for example. Dominique Ricard says, if the world that we are living in has moved from 65% front list to 65% back list, then the fundamental infrastructure that we've all built into our businesses needs to shift to represent that. And that includes the efforts that we ask from our authors. We need to be talking to our authors in different ways and asking different things from them. So remember, of course, that for indie authors, we have pretty much always had a backlist focus or a online focus. And this is one of the big differences between traditionally published authors and indie authors is a lot of us don't focus that much on launch. We focus on creating our pool of offerings and then people buy them. And most of us make most of our money from backlist and potentially always have. (laughs) So this is definitely something that traditional publishing is now coming into. And the big question is, well, hopefully that will mean that they'll start rewarding the more mid-list authors because they have a bigger pool of backlist books. Who knows? That would be nice. But I guess, of course, the other thing to remember is that for independent authors, there is no back and front of the store. We, you know, yes, you write another book now, but you're always promoting lots of different things. And this is a bit like what Dean Wesley Smith talks about in his book, The Magic Bakery, which is all about copyright and is an excellent read. He says there's no point in advertising your bakery if you only have one pie. That's just not enough inventory. So again, the idea is, yeah, the magic bakery is the slicing up of copyright, which returns to you and you can keep making money on. But if you've only got one pie, that's not going to interest people. What you need is a bakery full of different pies and maybe cakes and bread and other things. (laughs) Probably made you hungry now. But essentially, I'm just finding this fascinating that traditional publishing is now discovering that the online world functions differently to the bookstore way of doing things. And I think we're going to see this realisation more and more. 
In other news, the shake-up of audio continues with both both Apple and Spotify this week announcing page subscription options for podcasting. Now, don't turn off or scroll forward if you don't podcast, because I know most of you do not have a podcast at the moment. But I want you to expand your idea of what a podcast is. So yes, you're listening to this show right now, which is uh, an interview show and an opinion-based show and kind of a bit of a news show show. Uh, It's basically on-demand audio delivered over a feed or an app, but it doesn't have to be an interview show like this. You could publish an audiobook through a podcast feed, and now it's directly monetizable. So it's not just about marketing. And I think one of the reasons why most people have not podcasted their audiobooks is because there's no way of getting paid for that. But you could podcast an audiobook. You could also have something special for your fans, uh, an inside track for your creative process, for example, or a limited series that accompanies your book. So this is something I'm considering for for example, the shadow book. I'm considering doing a limited interview series about the shadow and maybe that will be a monetizable product that you'll get as part of the book purchase. But what we know, I don't know, I'm just trying to widen our possibilities because many people say, oh, I'll never do a podcast because they think it will be like this, where they have to have opinions or report on things or interview people. But it doesn't have to be that way. It can be your stories. It can be uh, stuff about your research. There are so many things. Also, it can be um, very discreet. So, for example, you can have an eight part series that's then done. That's final. And this is what I think is very interesting. Also interesting is talking back on contracts. Many publishers are now including clauses in their contracts around podcasting rights. So if you're going to sign a contract, please watch out for that kind of thing, because the audio market just is shifting so fast. There are more and more opportunities in audio. And if you sign your rights away, you won't be able to do anything about it yourself. So just be very clear on what you're signing as ever. So yeah, keep an eye on that, because uh, Apple's paid subscription is limited to iOS, but Spotify is going to have a more open access system, which means wide audio. And as ever, the wide mentality is about being everywhere, having breadcrumbs leading back to me, wherever you choose to listen or watch or read. So I, this is filling me with lots of ideas around things because essentially you have to monetize at some point your audio because otherwise it's very difficult to keep it going. It has to market something specific. It it, it has to, I mean, maybe it will be a personal branding exercise, but you have to somehow make the money for the time that you spend on it. And I'm very grateful to my wonderful patrons and also to the corporate sponsors who enable me to do this. But if I was going to do more audio stuff, I'd want it to be monetized in other ways. And I think this subscription revenue might be really interesting. So there's nothing right now on this open access system, but Spotify have said it is coming. Also interesting is that Spotify have said the program will come at no cost to the creator. So you get 100% of subscriber revenues and then in 2023, introducing a competitive 5% fee. So I can see that actually replacing Patreon for many podcasters. So that will be interesting uh, in terms of the fees. So yeah, again, more shakeups in the world of monetizing your content. And then finally, I wanted to mention the Alliance of Independence blog at selfpublishingadvice.org, which had a great roundup this week on comments about self-publishing through personal struggles with uh, various authors talking about how poverty, disability, dyslexia, parenting issues and mental illness have impacted their self-publishing journey. And certainly one of the themes of the article is that all writing advice does not apply to everyone. (laughs) And you have to adapt to your situation and that will change at different times. Now, I'm very aware that what I say here is my opinion and also my guests, it's their opinion and it's based on our experience and it will never be your experience. So I do hope that you understand that I'm not saying you must do it this way. Uh, I hope that I'm open enough and sort of sharing my journey and sharing my thoughts, but that you understand that it's not prescriptive and the indie author world is a very broad church. 
In fact, as Dan Holloway says in the in the article, and he writes about mental illness and neurodiversity, he says the indie world is such a broad landscape that there are spaces even for someone like me and someone like you too and a weirdo like me. (laughs) So thanks for sharing that, Dan, and also all the people who wrote in that article. It's very, very good. Um, That's at selfpublishingadvice.org. Again, links in the show notes. So in my personal update, nothing particularly new, just researching and reading and writing and walking and even starting to be more social again. Outside, of course, we're still uh, only allowed to meet people outside. And by the time this goes out, I will have had my first vaccination, which is why I'm recording this a bit early, just in case there's any uh, sleepy side effects or anything like that. So the rollout continues to different age groups here in the UK, and it does make us feel like freedom is peaking over the horizon and perhaps there might be some travel coming. Who knows? So I did put a blog post up this week on affiliate income, uh, a chapter from how to make a living with your writing. And affiliate income can be a fantastic extra source of income and an ethical one if you only promote tools, software and services that you use and recommend and you have an audience. And I have and I include ideas for fiction and non-fiction authors on that article. So check that out on the blog or links in the show notes. And also for your virtual escape, check out my books and travel podcast this week with another Nadine, Nadine Slavinsky, on sailing across the Pacific. Imagine lying back on the ocean, looking up at the Southern Cross and the stars above. And it's a lovely um, interview. And uh, Nadine also writes fiction as well based on her travels. And that podcast really keeps my own sort of wanderlust in check, as I can imagine traveling without actually going anywhere. (laughs) So I particularly enjoyed that interview. That's on the Books and Travel podcast. Just search Books and Travel on your app. Also, someone asked this week and it kind of made me laugh in a way but in a rueful manner someone said do I actually write anything that is not about writing or self-publishing for you know and the question is are you just someone who writes about writing and who doesn't really write which is kind of odd because most of us who write about writing are writing books like I've written what 12 books on the author's various parts of the author journey (laughs) but I wanted to and I kind of it was on Twitter and I just tweeted back um I'm also, uh, I also have 17 novels <laughs> under JF Penn uh, across action adventure, dark fantasy and crime and psychological thriller. And it just reminded me that there are pros and cons of two author brands. And obviously the good thing is that this, you're, I'm Joanna Penn talking to you right now. And on uh, books and travel, I'm Joe Francis Penn or JF Penn. And so I keep them separate and I'm never going to talk about self-publishing on books and travel like that's just not going to happen because that's not what that show is about and so I like having two separate brands because it's very clear what you are getting you the audience are getting many of you will not have read any of my fiction and don't want to and that's fine and again people who read my fiction don't have to care anything about how the books are made you know the, the the sausage making the sausage side of it they don't need to know about the factory and what goes on behind the scenes but for me I like having two brands because of that but it does mean that sometimes people think that you are just someone who talks about doing it without actually doing it although again I have absolutely no issue with people who write books on writing Uh, you know that's what I do too so yeah I thought I would um, share that with you because I thought I made it very clear that I also have fiction and write other things and I've got ideas for lots of stuff to write under JF Penn like I've got um I am going to put the shadow book under Joanna Penn but I and I was thinking about putting it under JF Penn but it is turning into another kind of writing book writing self-help book Um, but I'm gonna have a book on pilgrimage after next year so by this time next year I will be starting to write that book and I also have some uh, other travel type books which I'll put under JF Penn so yeah there is nothing wrong with whatever you write but yeah I thought I would share that with you So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Charlotte at Curativity says, I really love the episode with David Cadavy. I've just downloaded the audiobook to be more time efficient. Fantastic. Ruth Curtsy says, listening to the podcast while packing up my home in preparation of moving to the coast, using my time creatively and keeping my mind occupied instead of stressing about the upcoming move. 
Brilliant. I hope your move went well, Ruth. Claire S. Author says, enjoying the episode on my lunchtime walk. So excited about the shadow book. I feel like I've been getting hints about it for years and today got a bit more of a glimpse. Thank you so much, Claire. And yes, the reason that is the reason I shared a bit more last week, because people have said, oh, I thought it was this. I thought it was that. And I'm like, "Mm." well, what I'm going to do once I've written the first draft is I will probably be doing a survey and asking people for their thoughts. (laughs) so that the book turns out to be what you guys think it's going to be and somehow I can make it something that will hit all the right notes. It is one of these books that doesn't have uh, many, it doesn't have any comp titles actually, uh, comparison titles, because most of the books on the shadow are aimed at the psychology market uh, or the sort of yeah, completely different market usually. And so this is this is quite a different one. We shall see. And then um, Walter Manson on YouTube says, amazing interview. Every time I tune into the show, it becomes more of my favourite podcast. Thank you, Walter. And finally, Vesta Giles also on YouTube said, I really connected with a lot of this interview with David Cadavy. I stopped looking for a minimum word count and started saying I would write for a certain amount of time on my writing days. That way, my measure of success isn't a number, but it's a quality passage and a sense of progress so that is fantastic I totally that's where I am right now in my writing process is is uh, time assigned to thinking about these things rather than words on the page so today's show is sponsored by Readsy the marketplace for vetted professional freelancers who can help you with your independent author career they have editors cover designers book designers formatters as well as people who can help with your website marketing and advertising and appropriately for this podcast they have translators if you would like to do translation I have used Readsy to find experts to help with my Amazon and Facebook ads for both fiction and non-fiction when I basically came to the end of my tether and decided to outsource it. So you outline your project, you check out freelancers and receive quotes, agree a timeline and a contract and then start working together. I love that Reedsy vets the freelancers so you can be confident in the quality of the work but also all the payments and communication go through the Reedsy marketplace so it's all transparent so if you have a problem with the freelancer they can help you sort it out. Reedsy also have free courses that can help you with everything from craft to self-publishing and marketing. They have free formatting tools, lists of book bloggers to get reviews and more. Check it out through my link, thecreativepen.com forward slash Reedsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y, thecreativepen.com forward slash Reedsy. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time and my brain is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you to everyone who's been supporting the show so long. Thanks to new patrons in the last week. Miss Betty Black, Flip Wilkgren, Sara Lee Etta, Shelley Sara, Jude Timas, Mike Teft, Gwyneth Gibby and Grayson. Thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. It means so much to me that you want the show to keep going after all these years. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month, a coffee a month or a couple of coffees. If you're feeling generous, you get the extra monthly Q&A audio and some behind the scenes stuff and you get a uh, percentage off my courses and my books and things like that so check it out at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen and remember if you do subscribe and sign up to support the show on patreon it doesn't have to be forever you can come along sign up for a couple of months and then uh head off again that is absolutely what happens uh but yes come and support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen right let's get into the interview Nadine Mutas is the award-winning author of paranormal romance novels with books published in German, French and Italian as well as English. Welcome Nadine. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. We're going into translations today but before we get into it tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I'm a German citizen, native speaker and um, so 
we just moved to the US in uh, 2012. And actually, be, even before that, I started writing in English, interestingly. Like most authors will tell you, I kind of started imagining stories and set on the path to becoming a writer when I was a kid. But like really professionally starting to write, like seriously with a professional interest, I started in 2011 when I wrote my first full-length novel. And like I said, interestingly, that one came out in English. And like a lot of Germans, I actually speak English really well um, like you know starting when we learn it in school we start pretty early and I also spent a high school year in the U.S. when I was 17 so I you know that really helped me get to almost a native level of speaking English and so when I wrote that first full-length novel in 2011 it just it came out in English like that's what happened and so when I was finished with that one I was just sitting there like well okay this is a full-length novel and like what can I do with it and that's when I started researching publishing and you know how to get it out and that's what set me on the path to really get into the industry of publishing because I had no idea about anything and this was 2011 when like uh, self-publishing was just about really starting to to take off but it was still there was still so much stigma around it you know and so when I first started researching what to do with it it was just really trap pop was like the thing still and so that's what I figured I would do and I actually wrote another novel, like that first one that I wrote. That one wasn't the one that I sent out queries for and tried to get published because the more I learned about the craft of writing, I was like, eh, you know, that first one wasn't so great. And so with the second one I wrote, I actually... Um, incorporated so much stuff that I had learned in the meantime about the craft of writing and just how to do it right. And so that was also the first novel that I actually did get published. And by that time, that was 2015, when I published that one, I had actually um, researched so much about publishing and so much time had passed that I found out that the better option for me would be to go the indie tread route, uh, the indie route, um, rather than tread pub. Because what I liked most about, you know, self-publishing was the idea of having more control over my product, like creatively and in terms of marketing and business. And so that's what I did then. And in 2015, I published that first novel. I went on to publish four more novels in that series and a novella. And so that I, I really concentrated on that first series at first. And only recently in December, I published the first book in another series, but in the same subgenre. Because like I really wanted to focus on one subgenre first to really, you know, establish my brand and, and get my name out there. So yeah, that's how I started. And it's so funny, you mentioned there the stigma. And I mean, what we know is that the German market, and I've spent time in Germany, I have German friends, and I feel like the German literary tradition is perhaps even more sort of highbrow than say, oh, yeah. the British, for example. And I still find, I mean, in Germany, that, I mean, you know, you're now in America and yeah. I found this too as a British person. If I wasn't living in Australia when I discovered self-publishing, I don't know I could have done it living here in England yeah. because the stigma is so high. So do you think that being in America was what helped you? And any thought, because I know there's a lot of people listening in Germany and Austria and places where, <laughs> you know, where the German language is the, the primary language, but who still feel that stigma. Like, what would you say to those people? So definitely, I, I felt the same that being in the United States really gave me that edge to um, uh, really see self-publishing as a viable option and shake off that stigma. And so what really helped me was when I when we moved over here in 2012, um, I became a member of the Romans Writers of America. And I went to the local, meeting, the local meetings and I met, you know, so many other writers that really encouraged me. And some of them were self-published at the time already. And I just saw their success stories that it was a viable option like I said and you could do this and you know they did it well and it really paid off for them and it was just the more I learned about it and part of it was Romans Writers of America like their resources that they had the discussion groups the forums that really helped me get that perspective that self-publishing is not this like taboo thing and it does not mean lesser quality and all these rumors that uh, trend publishing like to spread about it in the beginning but I do think it, it's definitely harder to do it outside the United States or it was harder to do it now by now I think it is also a viable option in Germany I can only speak for Germany obviously like I don't know um, what it's like in you know other countries but in Germany like KDP and especially KDP select like Kindle Unlimited is a huge thing for authors so most of my author friends in Germany I see them going that route and um, but it is 
definitely a thing you can do in Germany now and do it well. Like I know quite a few of them who really make a good living self-publishing, you know, just Amazon exclusive in Germany. But that is something that happened, you know, with definitely a lag of a couple of years, like after, like behind the United States. So that's what I, I think is the thing for Germany. I think of it as Germany is behind the development, especially in terms of ebooks, when you compare it to the United States by several years, I would say maybe five years at least. And so there is still a very, very high prevalence of print books in Germany. Like that is the thing to do. Like most readers, when you ask them, where do you find your, your books, new books? And they would say, well, they still go into a brick and mortar bookstore and just browse the shelves. Right. And so traditional publishing in Germany still has a much stronger foothold than in the United States, especially still for genre books. Like here in the United States, for example, when you look at romance, most of the traditional publishers have ceded that um, market to the indie authors. So there's not as many new romance authors being taken on by traditional publishing. And the same is not true for Germany. Like even for the well selling genre books, um, traditional publishing is still the the way to go, sort of, say, for a lot of German indies. And I, I still see a lot of German indies, like when they make it big at being an indie, you know, like earning a lot of money, um, selling their, their own ebooks, they then go to traditional publishing and take on a contract with a trad pub house. And um, so you can still see there is a higher value attached to like being with a traditional publishing house in Germany. It's like they want that stamp of approval and maybe even just giving up like the hard part of the business and marketing to a traditional publisher. And yeah, so that's that's the situation in Germany. It's funny because I've been to Frankfurt Book Fair a number of times and the first time I went, I don't know how many years ago, eight years ago or something, I felt very like there was nobody like me at the fair. And then the last time I went on in 2019, there was a whole section for authors and indie indie authors and it was brilliant. I mean, it was and mostly romance, fantasy, sci-fi, obviously Mm -hmm. genre fiction does really well because it's underserved by traditional publishers. But I did feel like things are definitely changing. And then of course the pandemic has uh I think what we've seen the numbers has really grown readership in digital across Europe so I think what we're going to see is more readers coming into ebooks in German you know German speaking territories uh, uh, and um, French and Italian and and these things so yeah I I want people listening to realize that we are only at the beginning of some of these markets right I feel like it's almost 2011 uh, as if it were 2011 in America is 2021 in continental Europe. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was saying, that Germany is behind the United States, but they're going to catch up. It's, it's just a matter of years before, like, you know, the younger German population, they're going to gravitate toward maybe reading on their phones. So there's definitely a huge potential for, like, even more people getting into reading ebooks in Germany. It's, it's still, a, like, a rather small part of the market, but it's growing, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And also, just to say, the German market, very big readers, like, huge readers. That, oh, I mean, yes. that's very important to say. Everybody <laughs> exactly. reads, and as you say, educated, generally, you know, obviously there's different classes in every country but people with money anyone who hasn't been to Germany we're we're talking (laughs) people who read so that's quite exciting I think (laughs) yeah yeah I always say like we're book people like we breathe books like really we grow up loving books and it's like a lot of people like when I tell them you know I'm doing translations and they always ask me like oh are you doing Spanish or like Russian or Hindi because they figure or even Chinese because they figure like that the size of the population is like an indicator for how well you will like how well books will do in in that market but it's that's actually not true it's a fallacy because it's not the size of the population it's more about the book buying habits of that population and Germany has like a very very strong book buying habit like we love spending money on books like actually buying them and I'm sure piracy is a thing it's like a thing in pretty much all countries around the world but much less so than in other countries um so when you look toward Russia, for example, or India, even though they have like a large population, especially India with like over a billion people, right? And they do read English. So you would think, hey, it, it pays off to be in there in that market, maybe even Hindi, because that's millions of speakers. But the thing is that 
they don't have this, this the same strong book buying culture as Germany, for example. So they buy a lot of like used paper bags. They're very cheap to get in like those little corner bookshops or they do a lot of piracy, like downloads, illegal downloads. And it's it's sadly really a thing in, in Russia and in India. China is a like it's hard to get into that market but because it's so controlled by the Chinese government. And especially for someone writing romance like I do, romance is considered almost porn. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's very, very regulated. And you would have to go like indie going indie into China is pretty much impossible. You have to go with a traditional publisher there and it has to be sanctioned by the Chinese government. So it's it's fraught with difficulties. And it's not as easy as it you know sounds, oh, go to China and there's like millions of people or like a billion people um, ready to read. And yeah. the same goes for Spanish. It's like they have um, a very strong like book buying habit toward like secondhand paperbacks in, in stores, especially in Latin America. But they don't have such a like developed ebook reading market that's ready for you to go in there as an Indian and really make money, you know, selling your ebooks. And then there's the whole thing with the, the, the Spanish market worldwide is on the one hand, you have like Spain Spanish, like the Castellano in, you know, from, from Spain. And then you have the Latin American Spanish, which is, there are differences. And when you translate your books into Spanish, you have to pick one or the other, right? You have to go with a translator that is either Latin American or, you know, Spain Spanish, because I, I forget which one it is, but one side of them doesn't like to read the other. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. So if you pick one of them, that's you're all, you're already excluding the other market, so to say. And it's, it's not as easy. So going with like a seemingly smaller population size like Germany is it, it sounds weird at first but it totally pays off because Germans are just they're hungry for books and they like to buy them that's the thing yeah and also the economy I mean the economy is yeah. you know pretty similar and the euros I mean obviously you've got German French and Italian all euros and yeah. kind of equivalent pricing to the US really in terms of yeah. what you can price your books at and I think that's the other thing people you know a lot it's very hard to compete in say you mentioned India you can get a full price new paperback for like 150 rupees and exactly if, yeah. if you leave the default pricing your ebook is going to be priced at sort of 900 rupees so I think the the economics, yeah and that is unaffordable for most exactly of them, right? it's yeah. unaffordable for us and it's unaffordable for them so like you're exactly right there are lots of reasons why you would choose these languages but let's uh, but okay so it makes sense you chose German <laughs> you're German the market's growing but why French and Italian is it a similar reason in the, the currency yeah. and the culture exactly a similar reason so they're both um countries that are comparably doing well in terms of economy. I mean, Italy has some issues sometimes, but what surprised me, like I picked Italian as like the second foreign language to translate into, mainly because I saw a recommendation in one of my author groups on Facebook for an Italian translator, and he was really cheap, <laughs> but also he had like great recommendations. And so like, that's the holy grail that you want to find. You want to find the translator that is affordable for you as the author, but also delivers great quality. And you get, you know, when, when you vet him or her, you can see that they deliver consistent quality, that the reviews are good, and that other authors who worked with them say, like, yes, they're awesome. And he was sort of the holy grail in that. Like, he was cheap and he was good. <laughs> so that was just um, my consideration. Like, I, I was trying to decide between doing French or Italian next. And I com compared the prices for French translation to him, like, being the the Italian translator that I was recommended and he was so much cheaper that I was like okay let's do him first you know with Italian because it's just gonna save me a lot of money compared to French and then when the Italian stuff does well I can still expand into French and that's exactly what I did so I had him translate my four novels in that one series and I pretty much I did a rapid release in Italy I didn't know if that would work so I put the first one up for 99 cents and then like, I think it was just three weeks later that I dropped the second one. And then three weeks later, the, the four, uh, third, and then a month later, the fourth. And so I, I just, I sort of stockpiled the translations first to be able to do that rapid release. And it worked off, it worked beautifully. Like within six months after the release of the first one, I had made back all my translation costs and I was doing, you know, getting profit uh, from the translations. And so since that worked so well, I then decided um, to get into French translations this year. So that was really just the only reason that my Italian translator was so much cheaper than French that I did Italian first. Otherwise, I might have well have done uh, French first because I heard it's a really good market to go into, especially with Romans. 
Ah, interesting. Yes. And I I feel this is a really important thing to talk about in that you write romance and you've got um there, what do you say, five book series? Um, yeah. So it's yeah. um it's four novels and one novella four, in that one okay. series. Yes. And and so then how how long are they? 50, 60,000? I write pretty long. So the first one is actually like super long. It's a 109,000. Oh, okay. Uh, words. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, I, I really tend to go long. My readers love it though. And um, so they're all around that, like between like 70,000 and 100K um, words. And the novella is 35K. So I, I do price them at 499 US dollars and also 499 in, in euro. Right. Because this is something I think is really important. Romance is an underserved niche in those markets. It's not in the US anymore. This is this is <laughs> what's so interesting is that of you've obviously seen that you can put books early. Again, it's like being a romance writer on Kindle in tw- t- 2011, when there are barely any other authors writing in paranormal romance in those countries. That's but- exactly it. I was going to say, like, it, it also depends, like, what sub-genre of romance, like, contemporary romance, for example, is, like, there's lots of that going on in, in uh, Germany, especially um, from the traditional publishers they do take up the big names from the US and translate them into Germany um, and to German and so with contemporary romance it's a much more competitive market in Germany right now but paranormal romance is totally underserved from the traditional side of publishing in Germany um, because it, the same has been going on uh, in Germany that has been going on in the US that you know people have been saying like people from traditional publishing have been saying oh paranormal romance is dead and I mean it's yes. sort of like mm. the genre thing, like it's not dead, it's undead, it keeps coming back. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's never really gone away, really. So like, you know, vampires are this perennial thing, like it's it's just always there. And the same goes for shifters, they're like super big in Germany as well. And so if you do write quality germ- uh, paranormal romans and you translate that into German, you're bound to do well. So if the translation is good, because the readers are hungry, they don't get that kind of stuff from their traditional publishers in German. Yeah. And I think this is really important. uh, Don't try and compete with traditional publishers in the German market or French or Italian, because if you put your book that looks like one of their mainstream types, you're competing against them. But that's, I think this is one of the biggest tips, really. Only do the translation for books that have an underserved niche. Otherwise, you're going to really struggle. And um, so what are some of the other, what we, okay, you've talked a bit about finding that Italian translator you don't speak Italian so you didn't nope. really know uh, whether it was going to work so what are some of your thoughts on working finding and working together with translators yeah so my Italian is same as my French it's um like very very rudimentary very rusty so I, I do understand a little bit like if like my Italian readers make comments on my ads or whatever but definitely not enough to vet a translation so what is important for that and I mean it's going to be the same for most authors looking into translations you don't speak the language so what do you do how do you get the translator know that he or she is good and so the thing to to look for is First of all, word of mouth recommendations from other authors who have worked with that translator. That's the main thing, like really the most important aspect. Like you want to get someone who has a good reputation. And, um, and so another way to vet that reputation is that you go into Amazon and you type in the translator's name, either like from the agency or their, you know, the name of the translator, him or herself. And what should happen is that all the books that they've translated should come up on Amazon. And you want to do that, especially in the Amazon store of the target language. So for Italian, go to amazon.it and then type in the translator's name, look at the books that come up and then look at the reviews. And for that, you can actually use Google Translate. I don't recommend it for actually translating a book. We can get into that a bit more, but um, for easy stuff like just translating reviews to get the gist of what the review is talking about. Google Translate or like Deepl Translator is awesome because it will tell you whether the review mentions anything in terms of like quality issues with the translation because readers, especially when you look toward like Germany, they will let you know if the translation is crap. So (laughs) if there are like typos, errors, or even if the review says, oh, it reads clunky or something like that, those are buzzwords to look for that would tell you oh no that translation is not really good because then mostly it's not the problem of the book not being good but the translation not being good right Hmm. and so 
like the same goes for positive reviews when you you know look, look at them and you get the gist of the review and it mentions that you know the prose is nice or it, it flows well those are keywords to look for to get you the sense of like yes this is a good translation so the translator is doing good work and um, so that's what I did for my Italian translator I looked at you know the reviews of the books that he had translated and saw that yep they're consistent quality, they get good, good reviews, there are no red flags coming up in the reviews. So that's definitely something you can do to vet your translator. And then another thing, when you do contact them and ask them, definitely get a sample translation. That is a thing you can do. It's a couple hundred words or ask them how you know many words they can do as a sample translation for you. And then get native speakers of that language to vet the sample translation for you. And you, what you have to do is give the, the reader that vets the sample translation, give them the original and let, the, let them read them, like the original and the sample translation side by side to see if the translator missed anything. Or if they, for example, if it's a humorous excerpt, like, you know, with wordplay in it, if they got the wordplay right. And depending on your fan base, if you have a fan base in English, you can ask on like, say, your Facebook, your social media, hey, I'm looking for native speakers of this language to just look at a sample translation. Anybody who wants to do that, just hit me up via PM or email. And if you have enough of a fan base, then there will be readers who are like, oh, yes, yes, I speak the language and they can help you out with that. Or what I did with French, uh, when I went into French translations, I asked my Facebook friends. So I asked on my personal profile, like, hey, do I have any, you know, French native speakers among my friends? And um, if so, would you be willing to look at a 500 word sample translation? And that's definitely something you can do. Mm, yeah, it's, if you have an audience, well, if you have an audience already, there will be people you yeah. can ask in your community. And if you don't have an audience already, you shouldn't be doing translations. <laughs> Probably. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> I think that's really important. And I want to keep emphasizing this. Like, seriously, I did translations way too early. Back in 2014, I did uh, German, Italian and Spanish. And it was way too early in those markets. And mm. it cost me time. It cost me money. And I now have as of this week, four German non-fiction books because mm -hmm. the indie author market is underserved in Germany. Yes, so I've gone definitely. in with my non-fiction, but I know how much time it takes. It, and even though I'm not doing the translation, obviously, I'm um, yeah. emailing backwards and forwards. I'm getting exactly. things to various people. So tell us about the cost benefit analysis. So it's obviously money, but there's also time. So how did yeah. you decide it would be worth it? And has it been worth it? And any lessons learned in terms of how you could do it better? I obviously, with, with German, which was the first language that I did, I had the advantage of being a native speaker. And so what I did was I actually translated the first four titles in my series myself into German. I could do that, obviously, because I'm a native speaker. So that, that gave me the edge there. But what I noticed is that it just takes so much time to translate. And it's really not the thing that I want to do. I'd much rather create new stories in English. And it was like I was pulling out my hair in frustration. because, <laughs> And that's also something that I learned when I did the translations myself is that um, just because you're a native speaker doesn't mean you can translate. So like when you that's why, why I always say get someone who really is a professional translator that has the background, someone who studied it at, you know, university level, because just having someone who speaks English fluently and then the target language natively is not enough. Um, you have to that person has to have a native level understanding of English as well, just to be able to get the workplace and all those terms and turns of phrases right. But also it just, it takes skill to really be able to translate a lot of words every day and not like burn out on that. And that's something that you need to learn and train. But anyway, so I did the first four titles myself. And so when I published them obviously I didn't have the the investment of the money that goes into it usually when you pay for translations because I did it myself but it was definitely a time investment on my part because the the months and it took me months <laughs> to to translate which is sort of the thing when you think of a full-length novel of like say 80,000 words you cannot translate that in a month if anybody tells you they can translate that in a month I would be wary of the quality that they deliver. So it does, I usually think it takes as long to translate a book as it takes to write it in the first place. So sure, someone can do it faster and it might be good, but it's it's a good idea to go for people with a more reasonable amount of time that it takes them to do it, say two months, three months. 
so but it was a time investment on my part when it during the time that I translated myself I couldn't write anything new in English right so it was definitely the sort of trade-off for me and at, when I got to the fourth novel in my series that was just that had just come out in English I was so ready to give it up <laughs> the translation because mm. I was like okay I did the cost uh you know benefit analysis I was like uh yeah you know I can spend that time that I would you know spend translating I can spend that writing the next book in English and it would pay off much more for me and even when I have to pay thousands of dollars for a translation in German by now I knew that they were selling well for me in German so I knew that I would make back that investment in a reasonable time which really did happen so with the fourth book in my series when it came out in German I think just to give you some hard numbers here I paid was it seven thousand something dollars for that translation and I made back all of that within the first month after publication so and it and really paid off <laughs> yeah and I think but this is again so you had four books and uh, four books yes. and a novella and this is again important because it's very in the same as in English it's very hard to sell one book so I exactly. almost feel like you have to you should have a series preferably at least a trilogy at least three books in the same as we say for English if you have three books and then you can do discounting on book one then mm -hmm. you can sell more books so also another tip is don't spend seven thousand dollars to translate mm -hmm. one book because then it's just the same as having one book in English it's very hard to market exactly. would, would you you would agree with that too Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's it's not just about marketing and, you know, getting um, that that momentum going of like having a series and, and for readers to read on. In some markets like French, for example, that's something that I learned when I did research on doing, tr doing translations in, in French is that French readers especially have been burned by traditional publishing, taking on like American authors and like translating the first or like the first two books in, in their series into French, but then dropping the series because the numbers weren't there. And so like French readers have learned to be wary of any new authors coming into French with translations. And if they only see that there's, or if they see there's only one book in a series, like as a French translation available, and they don't see like a pre-order for book two and three, and they don't really see any plans for from the author to keep going, they are very suspicious and wary. And they will wait oftentimes to see if there's more of the series going to be translated, and the series going to be finished, and all of it translated into French before they jump on it. Because they have been burned so badly by traditional publishers, just starting series, like starting to translate series, and then stopping mid-series and never finishing them in translations. And so what I did with French to make sure that my French readers would see that, you know, I am... I'm in this for the long haul and I'm really, I'm committed to doing French translations of all my books and keep going is that I, again, I stockpiled the translations. I pretty much had the first three of them yet already translated now. And I'm waiting on the fourth to uh, drop. And I put them up for pre-order and made sure that the first three are up on pre-order already. So that French readers, when they click on the first one and then they see there's a series page and they see, oh, you know, the next two are up for pre-order already. And so they, are, they have more of a sense of security yet. Now, yes, this is a series that is ongoing and I can binge the series when it comes out, you know. Mm. No, I think that's great. So again, people listening, this is definitely an advanced thing in terms of translations. Like you said, having a plan, having multiple books. So you will have spent yes. 40, what, 21 grand up front to yeah it's it's definitely an investment i'd have to tell you it up what i did how much i spent but for the for the uh, italian translations for example i just recently did the tallying like how much it cost me to translate those first four books and it was like nine thousand dollars because he's very cheap again i was <laughs> gonna awesome. say yeah <laughs> everyone's yeah. gonna want his name <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely. Like, he's he's awesome. It's, uh, he's just a great guy. And he also gets my humor, which is very important. I write <laughs> funny books and he gets my humor. And that's uh, like, I, I feel, you know, like my books are in safe hands with him. But anyway, he's good and he's cheap. <laughs> and so I just paid $9,000 for, for all four books in, in my series. And, but I, again, I made that back within the first six months after release. But I had a marketing plan. I put the first one up for 99 cents as a loss leader. And then I dropped the next ones with a couple uh, weeks 
time difference. And it just, it went really well. Like if you can do that and just put books up for pre-order, like when you drop the first one, have the next one up for pre-order, have the link in the back. It's pretty much the same as you would do in English when you when you have the time to stockpile a couple manuscripts that you finished in the same series and you go about it in a smart way, which I don't do for my English. Like I, I write my English books, just I, I publish them as I write them. So I, I, no, I don't do the same thing for my English books, like being smart about it and all. <laughs> but with my with the translations, it's you can do that a lot more easily because it's not that you have to create something new. You just give what you already created to your translator and they do the work, right? And then you get back the translated manuscript and you can sit on it. You don't have to publish right away. And the smart thing to do is sit on it, stockpile the translations if they're in the series, and then you know just put them up for pre-order. Make sure the link is there, the back matter, which is something that I would also advise. Like Get your back matter, the front matter, and the back matter translated as well. That should be part of the package. Because you don't want to have a translation out there without like a list of other books in the series um, in the language, right? And put the links in there. So it's super easy for the readers to go on and binge that series. That's what you want. Mm. Yeah. And I think like we're talking about the investment and to me, it's you're creating an, an entirely new intellectual property <laughs> asset, basically, in this other language. Yeah. I mean, I feel with my translations and I've got quite a lot of different languages, most of which I've licensed now, but I don't feel like they're my book anymore because I can't read them. <laughs> Which is really yeah. odd. I'm like looking at it going, okay, my name's on it, but I, I really don't feel like it's my book, which is odd. And so but let's talk about a bit more about marketing. We've talked there about pricing and about <coughs> publishing. But one of the challenges, obviously, is if you don't speak the language, like I use podcasting as a big part of my nonfiction marketing, and I can't do that in any other language. Uh, being British, I don't speak anything else. <laughs> and But I do use for my German books, as you mentioned, KU, I as the easy thing I have my German books in KU yeah. and I use Amazon auto ads for those books and it seems to work quite well I don't have to do anything they yeah. just run automatically because those the algorithm works in that situation <laughs> but I don't have a newsletter in any other language I did actually try that in 2014 but it was just mm. horrible I make <laughs> it very clear that I'm English and I don't speak another language so I don't ask for people to email me or anything I don't have social media so I do <laughs> very little but I wondered about what do you do in terms of your marketing so I don't do Amazon ads because like I I never got them to work for me I'm just not you know spreadsheet like spreadsheet typey enough <laughs> to get them to work for me but I do Facebook ads they're you know easy enough for me to manage I, I do them for my English books and when you are familiar with them for your English books, then it's it's quite easy to do them for the translations as well. Um, because the only thing that changes is, of course, you have to have the ad copy translated into that language. Your translator can help you with that. So either add that word count to you know the manuscript word count when you get the the manuscript translation, so you can think of ad copy advance in you know in advance ahead of time. Or sometimes your uh, translator is super super nice and will do short ad copy for free, but don't expect it. Definitely ask them and like offer compensation. So it's it's only a couple, maybe 100 words or whatever, how short ad copy usually is. What you can also do is just take an excerpt of your book, like, um, like from your book. And the same thing I do for my English books. I, I've noticed that ec excerpts, like longer snippets um, from my book work really well. They work better than a short snappy ad copy because either I suck at snort a short <laughs> copy, short ad copy, or like it's just the, the excerpts speak for themselves much better. I don't know, but it's just, I noticed that works really well with my target audience, apparently. And the same goes for English and Ita uh, for, for German and Italian. So that's re really what I, you know, did. And then if it's just like the headline for the Facebook ad that you need translated, definitely ask your translator, hey, can you translate sexy paranormal romance for me in, into Italian, you know, and they, they will do that for you very likely. And so the only thing you have to change for, for the Facebook ads to make that work is, like I said, the ad copy. And then the targeting, you can limit it to that country that you want to target, like Italy. Facebook makes that really easy for you. And then you would you would use the same sort of uh, interest targets as you do for your English Facebook ads. So um, I target the big paranormal romance names. So I you know usually go for Cressy Cole because she has like a huge uh, audience on Facebook and it works really well for me or Nalini Singh. And the same goes for Italy because like they have, I think 
both of them have been translated into Italian, definitely Nalini Singh. So there is also an audience for that same author in Italy, which makes it easy to target these fans on Facebook. And so that's what I did for German and for Italian, and it worked beautifully, especially after I put the first uh, book in Italian for free. So I now have it as a perma-free. And so when I did Facebook ads, um, you know, just advertising it as a free book, first free book in the series, it worked so well, like it skyrocketed my sales in Italy for that series and it paid off. And the thing you have to watch out for is when you do Facebook ads for um, your translations, you will get comments on those ads from readers in that language like the Italians especially they're very common happy <laughs> they <laughs> like to comment on my Facebook ads and so the thing is like I said I don't speak Italian like super fluently I speak it enough to like get the gist of like Facebook comments when I see a comment I'm like oh okay so this is the gist of what this person is talking about like they're praising my book or they're asking a question and so what you can do again is just use Google Translate or Deeple copy and paste that comment in there just to see what the person is talking about and then you can use the same thing, Google Translate or Deeple, to formulate your, your response. And it's okay to use those two things, like Google Translate or Deeple, to translate your, your comment answers, because it's just that. It's just a small comment answer. Now, if you were to make a Facebook post on your page for your, say, Italian readers, I would definitely say get that one translated professionally by your translator, because as a post on your page, it has a much wider reach. It's much more public than like an answer to a comment on an ad. So for that, for this wider reach, you want to, you know, make sure it looks as good as possible. It's it's error free and it, it sounds smooth because that's, it's your public facing persona, right? When you, when mm. you post that on Facebook, on your page, you want to make sure that an Italian reader scrolling by or being a fan of your page and they read that they see that it's correct and they don't get to thinking, oh, so do her translations sound the same as like this Google Translate mangled post, right? So <laughs> you want to make sure that that is, is up to par, right? And the same goes for your new newsletter. So if you do have a newsletter in like German or Italian, make sure that whatever you put out in the newsletter is not Google translated, but like professionally translated. Because again, that's, that is you want to put your best foot forward to make the best impression with that text toward your readers. Um, if it's just about answering a fan email or like a comment on an ad, again, you can use Google Translate because I think the um, the tolerance for errors in, in those instances is a lot higher than like, say, in the main text of a newsletter or in the main text of a Facebook post. And then just a quick one, you said you put the first Italian as perma-free. Does that mean yes. you're publishing wide with these books or I had assumed you were using yes. KU? Yeah, yeah, I actually, I am wide with my translations. I had the German translations in KU for, for a while just because I... I haven't been writing for like three years. Like I, I took a break due to burnout and personal grief. And so my translations really kept me afloat during that time. And just to make up more for like the lack of new content, I put my German translations into KU for a couple months. And it worked really well, especially when I, uh, when I advertised it on Facebook and put in KU, you know, free in KU uh, in the ad. And, but just in general, it's just my feeling. I like being wide. I like reaching as many people on as many platforms as possible. And this, like for my English books, and the same goes for my translations. And what I noticed is that, yes, of course, Amazon is still the most, you know, the strongest, the most dominant uh, retailer, even in the foreign markets like Germany and Italy. But especially for Italy, Google Play and Kobo are really doing well for me there. And so I would miss out on these readers if I were in KU with my Italian translations. And uh, just like with me being able to put the first one in the Italian series uh, for free as a perma freebie, again, that only works when you're wide, right? And mm -hmm. so that one, it has been wide for a year now, and it just keeps bringing in new readers to that series on, on like all wide retailers. And I don't want to change that because I, I just see the benefit of it. Like Permafree works really well for my Italian series. Definitely, mm, it, yes. it works. It works well with wide in general. And in Germany, are you seeing good sales on the Tolino? 
it's lagging behind Amazon, like by, you know, <laughs> a large margin. Like I know I would probably make a lot more money if I were in KU in Germany, but it's, it's like I said, it's a principle for me, like a not put all my eggs and, you know, one basket kind of thing. And I don't want to rely on Amazon for like my page reads, like, and just wait for the day that they strip me of page reads, like all of a sudden arbitrarily. I've heard too many horror stories of that to just like go on, rely on that. But uh, yeah, I'm still, I still hope that Tolino will grow for me as a market and it's like as like most people who are wide will tell you is that it, it takes a long time to build that and since I just I think it was last year that I was in KU with my German translations so and it's been a couple months since I switched back to wide which um, it means on the other hand that I am still in that building it up again phase right and mm. so I, I think it's going to take another couple months, maybe a year for me to really gain back the traction that I had on Tolino with my German books. And I hope that, you know, I will <laughs> gain more of a foothold again there. But yeah, oh no, that's I, good I to like being wide in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do as well with my English language. I just was like, I just need some something really simple and basic that I don't need to even yeah. look at. So I think there's so much to think about. It's so good to talk to you, but we're, we have run out of time. So <laughs> tell us where can people find you and your books in all your languages online? The best place is my website, which is just uh, nadinemutas.com. And I actually have like this nifty little tool on my website. It's like when you in the upper uh, left hand corner, there's like flag icons. And so I have it in English, in German and in Italian. Soon I'm going to put the French stuff there too. So if you click on that flag icon and like you're an international reader, like you're German or Italian, you click on the German or Italian flag and the whole website gets translated. So like it's, it's really nice. And then you can just navigate through the menu and it's all in either German or Italian. And it just lets you navigate through the whole site and see everything in your language. So yeah, the, the, you can find you know my my English books and my translations on the website. And like I said, they're on all retailers. So you'll find me on Amazon, Google Play, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, um, Apple Books, like all these places <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Well, thanks so much for your time, Nadine. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, it was so nice chatting with you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Nadine today and that it's given you a glimpse of what's possible when you own and control your intellectual property rights. And remember, you can find translators on Readsy. And if you'd like to support the show, please use my link, thecreativepen.com forward slash Readsy. So coming up this week, I have another in between episode, The AI First Company with Ash Fontana, based on his book of the same name, which is out this week. And uh, I'll also give a bit of an update on the AI and futurist things that many of you enjoy hearing about. On next Monday's show, we're back to craft with Gail Carragher talking about the heroine's journey. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>